So uh, I as uh, am, am Steve Cole, as you probably mostly know, I study the everyday life of the human genome. And um, most of the time when I tell geneticists about that, they think that's kind of a strange thing to do. I mean, they think of genomes as having lives measured in Darwinian time, not in sort of human experiential time. So usually I start talks by uh, describing a little bit about how we got here, what even motivated us to look into how everyday life circumstances change genome function. So here's an example of that kind of thing. Um, these are data from a molecular epidemiologic study when we're looking at white blood cell gene expression, the activity of genes in terms of RNA transcription um, in a small number of people exposed to one of epidemiology's most toxic environmental risk factors. Um, individuals in this heat, heat plot correspond to rows. Um, the columns correspond to uh, one of about 200 or so genes that we found to differ in average transcription activity in the white blood cells of individuals exposed to high versus low levels of the risk factor. And basically, to the extent that the cell defined by the intersection of an individual row and a gene column, to the extent that that's red, that means high activity or high rates of transcription of that gene in that person's white blood cells. If it's green, that means low rate. So all these red and green blocks really tell us, uh, essentially, is that there are 70 or so genes that are systematically more active in the white blood cells of people exposed to high levels of this risk factor, about 130 genes systematically less active. And it turns out those are not a random smattering of all 20,000 genes in the human genome. They actually represent a few sort of functionally coherent clusters, or you can think of them as kind of organized conspiracies in genome activity. Um, so for example, prominent among the genes that are more active in people um, exposed to high levels of the risk factor is a block involved in inflammation or the uh, body's first line of defense against uh, wounding injury and the initiation of immune response. Um, and prominent among the genes that are less active in people exposed to high levels of the risk factor are genes involved in defending uh, cells essentially against intracellular pathogens like viruses. So this kind of transcriptional shift, if you will, this sort of redeployment of, um, you know, sort of immunologic resources, I think wouldn't be particularly surprising if the risk factor that we were looking at in this study were things like, you know, benzene in the drinking water or viral infections or any of the other things that we think of as the sort of material influences on genome function. But what I was sort of struck by in this particular study is that the risk factor that's actually structuring these differences in gene expression is simply the extent to which people in the first few rows of the heat plot feel disconnected from the rest of humanity. So it's really loneliness that is structuring these differences in gene expression. And that to me was a little bit more of a puzzle. It wasn't particularly clear to me why our genomes should care about our, you know, sort of subjective social experience of life and, you know, sort of how that um, plays out uh, in the world that we experience, you know, with our brains and behavior, as opposed to, you know, what presumably the immune system should be doing, which is managing our microbial existence. Um, so that, that was kind of a, a provocative result. And we started, you know, following up on that with questions about other kinds of life circumstances. And soon it became clear that this particular thematic shift here, this sort of increase in inflammatory biology at the expense of antiviral defenses really wasn't specific to loneliness. We see similar kinds of profiles taking place in a wide variety of adverse life circumstances. It seems as though anytime people are feeling essentially threatened or insecure for an extended period of time, you start to see this shift towards more inflammatory gene expression, less antiviral gene expression. And over the ensuing maybe decade or so since we observed this initially, we've learned actually a fair amount about how this comes to pass. We know that much of this particular effect is mediated by increased activity in the fight or flight stress response system, particularly sympathetic nerve fibers releasing uh, catecholamines like uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine that then interact with beta adrenergic receptors on the surface of immune cells and change the rate of gene transcription selectively for the, the you know, sort of genes that those transcription factors target. Um, so one of the major mechanisms involves sort of, you can think of it as in existing cells, they get advice to change their ongoing transcription. 
Um, we also know that these effects take place predominantly within actually a small minority of circulating white blood cells, mostly monocytes and to a lesser extent dendritic cells, other cells of what are called the myeloid immune cell lineage. In addition to changing per cell transcriptional activity in existing cells, um, these kinds of instructions also actually remodel, you can think of it as sort of the cellular population structure of the white blood cell pool as a whole. What happens is that adverse life circumstances, as they're activating, you know, sort of brain mediated threat processes and sympathetic nervous system activity, one of the places these sympathetic nerve fibers deliver these norepinephrine signals um, into tissue is in the bone marrow microenvironment that's actually involved in continually regenerating our white blood cell pool. So every day, billions of white blood cells die in our bodies and need to be replaced. So on a completely ongoing basis, we've got these hematopoietic stem cells that are busily proliferating um, and you know, sort of making uh, to, to some extent at, at random sort of all the different types of blood cells that are needed to replace those that are being lost on a daily basis. And these stem cells, when uh, norepinephrine is released, end up getting a message via a, a hematopoietic growth factor, they call it. Essentially, you can think of it as biochemical advice to these stem cells that says, basically, make less T cells and B cells and make more of these myeloid lineage cells like monocytes, dendritic cells, that kind of thing. So as a consequence, when people are feeling threatened or insecure and have a lot of sympathetic nervous system activity for an extended period of time, they basically end up making more monocytes and granulocytes in their bone marrows. And those cells then go out into circulation and affect tissue in ways that would be a little bit different had you not been, you know, in some sense, overproducing these myeloid lineage cells. So for example, um, these cells by themselves don't cause disease, but when you get some kind of an insult from another source, these cells can respond in ways that actually exacerbate disease. So for example, um, in the context of, um, I, sorry, my little screen here, I have to collapse all these smiling faces because I can't tell what appeared. Um, in, in, if you get a brain injury, for example, these monocytes will tend to produce uh, hyperinflammatory responses that contribute to neurodegeneration. Uh, um, if you get uh, just sort of normal wear and tear in your coronary artery, these cells will get in there and build atherosclerotic plaques faster and bigger um, than would have been the case otherwise. If you get um, you know, sort of a lung infection, these cells will get in there in a way that we're all now familiar with from COVID uh, and create these hyperinflammatory so-called cytokine storms that end up destroying lung tissue and, and really you know, sort of damaging our respiratory system. Um, these cells inadvertently promote the progression and metastasis of cancer. Um, of particular relevance these days, these cells also supply advice to other cells of the immune system about how to battle pathogens. And in fact, in general, these cells will mitigate against effective viral responses and tend to promote more effective responses against bacterial pathogens, which is great if you've got a bacterial infection, but if you've got a coronavirus infection, it's not such a great thing. So I'll show you, and, and speaking of coronavirus, one example of how this plays out. Um, we were kind of looking recently um, in Reese's macaques at how lockdown, you know, of the sort that we experience these days in kind of pandemic public health responses, how, how that, you know, we know that's very burdensome psychologically and socially. Is that stuff actually going to change your biology? So we're looking at this in the context of animals whose social existences we can control fairly well. These are rhesus macaques in the California National Primate Research Center. Um, normally they live in these big field cages, which you can see are populated with all kinds of fun stuff to play on, roofs to hang out on, but most importantly, lots of other fellow macaques. Um, so you can hang out on the play structure or the Ferris wheel or the roof with all of your friends. But what happens if one day someone comes along and takes you out of this nice social environment and instead puts you into uh, what passes for an apartment in the monkey world um, all by yourself. So you're not being harmed. You've you know, got space. It's not torturous. This is like completely sort of normal individual animal housing in the, the macaque research world, not particularly distressing to the animals, but there's no social stimulation. There's toys, there's other stuff you can do. There's just not anybody you can do it with. Um, and that goes on for two weeks and we take blood samples and do a transcriptome profiling on this thing. So what we see um, is more or less 
similar in at least several major respects to what I was describing earlier. We see this bump up in what are called classical monocytes in circulation by about 9% about a 50% drop in the prevalence of the cells that make type one interferons, um, myeloid and plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And even on a per cell basis, the capacity of those cells to make interferon responses is also attenuated. This is because all of the signaling pathways that I was kind of talking about earlier, um, essentially are sort of uh, quantitatively inhibited by the physiological experience of being in lockdown, that is actually kind of reciprocal to increased activity in the transcription control pathways that convey uh, stress hormone and stress neurotransmitter signals, particularly the ones from the fight or flight stress response that come through beta adrenergic receptors and the Krebs transcription factor. So this is all kind of one example of the kind of broader theme that we run into that it, for, for whatever reason, and there's actually, it turns out to be good reasons for this, but for whatever reason, our bodies are wired to take misery and convert it into this kind of risky, to some extent, chronic disease promoting um, physiology. So as we've been looking about, you know, this, this kind of recipe for how not to live, both literally in the sense that, you know, you get disease produced by this and figuratively in the sense that this disease is arising in difficult adverse life circumstances, we at, at one point started looking more deeply at who might be protected against this kind of adverse genomic pivot, if you will, um, even when they're confronting adverse life circumstances. So that becomes sort of a question like about how we should live as opposed to how not to live. Now, asking this question in that way is like a little bit weird. You know, the people who usually think about how we should live are moral philosophers or perhaps they're kind of modern day equivalents of happiness psychologists. Um, when they think about how we should live, they've traditionally distinguished between two different versions of the good life. One that's filled with kind of happiness and I guess you can think of it as like consummatory self-gratification. Um, and another version that's more historically identified with purpose and meaning and a sort of engagement in some kind of higher cause or purpose other than your own immediate self-gratification, what uh, philosophers called eudaimonic well-being. So you can see here a little bit about how when people assess these questions, they, they get at different things through you know, self-report instruments. Do you feel happy and satisfied? being more like the hedonic aspects of the good life, whereas people saying, I feel like my life has a sense of direction or meaning, or I'm growing and becoming a better person. That's kind of a little bit more the flavor of eudaimonic well-being. So in an early study, we were actually looking at these two different types of happiness and asking which, if either of them, was associated with less activity of that kind of threat-related gene expression profile. And interestingly enough, um, you know, as you might expect, people with high levels of eudaimonic well-being actually looked pretty good. Um, they had higher levels of antiviral gene expression and lower levels of inflammatory gene expression. Interestingly, people with high levels of hedonic well-being, but in the absence of high levels of eudaimonic well-being, actually looked pretty bad. They had relatively high levels of inflammatory biology, even when we control for things like drug use and overeating and the other things that you might imagine people would do to kind of prop up their hedonic well-being. And this kind of surprising sort of um, dissociation between different types of well-being and their molecular signatures, at least it's registered in white blood cells, turns out to be surprisingly consistent. It's now a, a pretty reliable result at this point. So this brings up questions about, you know, sort of why is that happening if threat biology is really kind of the proximal mechanism here? Um, and what seems to be happening isn't that we you know so far we have not found eudaimonia you know nerves in the body or a new or, you know eudaimonia hormone that goes out and makes everything okay what seems to be happening is that when people feel connected to something that they value to some kind of cause or purpose that matters to them to anything that is big and important um, that's associated with increased activity in reward related circuits, particularly the ventral striatum. So they're like the caudate, putamen, the nucleus accumbens, these structures that are running on dopamine and are predominantly forward looking, searching motivational structures. They're not the reward structures that get activated when you get what you want. They're the reward structures that get activated to keep you hunting for what you want, keep you going off of what you want. And what's interesting about these structures is they exert 
some kind of lateral inhibition over threat-related central nervous system structures like the amygdala, which essentially allows individuals who are really excited about what they want to essentially feel less threatened or at least take threat less into account when sort of integrating all of the advice that you're gonna send out through the brainstem to the sympathetic nervous system and your motor system about how to run your body. So when this system gets activated, it actually essentially vetoes threat responses. And that seems to be why it is protective. So for example, people who get high levels of ventral striatal reaction, um, when you show them primes, you know, stimuli that represent the things that they value, tend to show markedly lower levels of inflammatory biology. So they're, they're and we, you know, the mouse studies at this point are beginning to map pretty clearly sort of the neurobiology through which that happens and the ways in which that ends up penciling out as changes in gene expression in circulating immune cells. So as a result of that, um, it turns out you can get people to do stuff that they regard as kind of valuable or contributory or important in a big life sense and see reductions in these threat related gene expression profiles. If you get people to be, you know, sort of teachers aides in really needy public schools in South Central LA, you get reductions in this threat related gene expression profile. If you randomize people to do, you know, essentially random acts of kindness for others, um, you see reductions in this profile. You don't see reductions in this threat related gene expression profile if they're asked to do random acts of kindness for themselves, or actually interestingly enough, even for the world in the abstract. It's only if they do random acts of kindness for some specific other living, breathing human being that we actually see these kind of favorable shifts in gene expression. So um, to kind of pick up a, a strand I started there earlier, um, let's go back to our, our Reese's macaques here and uh, ask what happens if they lock down with some kind of cause or purpose greater than their own immediate, uh, you know, sort of self entertainment. So there's a strategy for actually doing this in the monkey world that actually came out of, um, you know, Harry Harlow's early work and eventually was sort of developed by Steve Sumi and Melinda Novak, where they take an infant monkey and they put it in essentially the cage with an adult monkey that's really stressed out. And the adult monkey will typically go into some kind of caregiving mode that ends up, you know, both keeping the infant monkey well provisioned and entertained and taken care of, but also it turns out stabilizes the stressed out adult monkeys um, you know, sort of behavior and physiology. So uh, what we did is we took those monkeys that had been in lockdown for two weeks, put them back in their normal social field cages for another four weeks to kind of wash out that, I guess you can call it minor trauma. And then we put them into another cycle of lockdown in the, um, in the sort of monkey apartment but in the cage next door, we put an infant monkey and we opened up the door between the two cages so the two monkeys could interact. Again, did that for two weeks, took gene expression profiling and cell abundance data and all kinds of other immunologic measures. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what happened there. But let me just first point out that this is not obviously going to be, you know, sort of a highly successful solution. Here's the reason why. Hopefully you guys can hear this. Rats, my video is not working. Because of coronavirus, you are going to be quarantined, but you have a choice. Do you A, quarantine with your wife and child, or B? B. So the upshot there is, you know, there's no guarantee that being with your family and your kids, uh, as many parents in, you know, sort of lockdown will tell you, is going to be like a restful or rewarding experience. So. It was actually a non-trivial question, um, but it turns out actually it looks pretty good. So compared to what happens when you lock down with nothing better to do, basically, the animals that lock down with some kind of a social companion show actually reductions in those pro-inflammatory monocytes. Um, they show increases in per cell type one interferon biology, uh, reductions in that sort of suppression in the signaling pathways that support antiviral responses, and about a 50% reduction in the activity of the signaling pathways that are actually driving stress signals throughout the body in general. Um, even when we look in solid tissues like lymph nodes, uh, which is you know a, an environment that I'll explain in a minute why we decided to look at, but in that environment, we see for again, uh, lockdown with caregiving or eudaimonic lockdown, more interferon gene expression, reduced inflammatory gene expression, 
some uh, you know, sort of favorable shifts in the activity of those signaling pathways. The reason we looked at the lymph nodes is because that's an environment where there's a fair amount of viral replication, particularly for lymphotropic viruses. So we were able to actually see whether these changes in antiviral biology ended up shifting the activity of viral genomes. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw. There was no general reduction in you know, total whole genome activity for human, uh, sorry, for macaque genes or uh, for a wide variety of other like funguses and stuff like this. But viral gene expression dropped by a little shy of 50% as a function of locking down with the infant to give care to as opposed to locking down by yourself. So the upshot I'll leave you with is that our genomes are far more permeable to social experience than we typically appreciate. Um, to some extent, our genomes are not ours alone, although we think of them as the core of us. But in, in terms of how they realize as actual profiles of genomic activity, they're fundamentally a product of the communities we live in, in addition to a wide variety of things that we normally think. Even viruses know something about our social world and what kind of a life we're leading. So that gives us you know, sort of a lot of latitude in terms of influencing these things. To some extent, you can make decisions about how to live that are gonna have surprising degrees of implication for what's going on in not only your own genomes, but your microbes genomes as well. And with that, let me uh, thank the folks who contributed to this and uh, get off the stage without further ado here. Thanks, Steve. So I'm sure there's questions uh, from the audience. If you could uh, raise your hand in the audience if you'd like to be called on. I wonder if you have a short answer, Steve, while we're waiting about the results that you showed and whether you thought there were clear implications of how there are essentially around public messaging around the time of, the time of COVID about volunteer activities and so on and so forth. Uh, if you could maybe bring that out a little bit as we're thinking about other questions. Yeah, I think, you know, for a wide variety of reasons, both public health related and media, you know, traction related where fear and terror sells, you know, that you really don't have much of an opportunity to, um, you know, sort of talk in a, a more productive way about how to think about these things. So because everything is structured around fear, it's really working that system. But I think exactly to Jason's point, there's a wide variety of opportunities to actually message differently. And there's an interesting prototype for this. There was a lot of fear-based messaging, for example, in the early days of the HIV epidemic. And it wasn't until, you know, sort of uh, essentially community-based organizations that had a particular allegiance to the affected populations got involved that the messaging started changing into a more ideal-driven, you know, sort of health-driven, sociability-driven framework that ultimately was much more sustainable and impactful. So I think that's exactly right. There are big implications. and I do wish that people would, you know, make more of that, I guess, to, to put it simply. Do any of the co-panelists have thoughts? Because we have several uh, panelists who are going to be describing, you know, related research and maybe have, maybe pick Steve's brain while he's here. Um, I had a question actually. So I was wondering, Steve, I loved the little clip of the guy who immediately said B, he would prefer right. whatever, whatever option is not home with his family. Um, is there any evidence in humans that, you know, caregiving activities can have these kinds of biological effects? Yeah, definitely. Um, certainly, you know, in there's there's two strands of research that are not directly, you know, they, they sort of intersect on this. So one, you know, as I mentioned, there are studies where you can randomize people to do good stuff for others, which is argued to activate in this kind of vestigial way, you know, sort of caregiving circuitry or systems. Um, so that, that, you know, clearly you can randomize that. It, you can get it in undergraduates. You can get it even more strongly in adults. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of one line of research. There's another interesting line of research where we actually know that parents have, for example, stronger antiviral biology than do non-parents, than do uh, people who've never actually been involved in direct caregiving. Now, that might be because of central nervous system caregiving changing their physiology. It might also be because they've been exposed to more viruses by their, you know, sort of little vector children there bringing home stuff from kindergarten. So it's difficult in these kinds of observational human settings to actually 
dissect out what's going on. And that's exactly why we do the macaque studies is there we can, you know, at the very least orthogonalize that stuff. Um, and at the very best, we can actually experimentally manipulate it.